sometimes we get too reliant on third-party resources and then that information is transposed incorrectly and now we have a mess on our hands. What is your number one secret to saving money in taxes? <laughs> number one secret. I don't know if there are any secrets. It's pretty obvious. Um, number one secret. Uh, I am a tax research buff at heart. So I do a lot of tax research. I have always, I have subscriptions to the major tax research platforms. So like Thomson Reuters, CCH, Walter Schooler um, are places where I consider, you know, reliable sources. So I'd say my secret is uh, reliable sources. <laughs> Uh, of information and making sure that you're not just like Googling and then you took the first article and that must be true. Um, get to the core of real information that is backed by tax code that you then can verify. Um, sometimes we get too reliant on third party resources and then that information is transposed incorrectly and now we have a mess on our hands. Sure. Okay. Um, so tell me, have you, have you learned about the deferred sales trust? Um, on the sale of a highly appreciated asset and kind of like, what are your thoughts on that? Oh, interesting. Um, I haven't done <laughs> the first sales trust in college, but uh, <laughs> let me see. What are my thoughts on it? Um, I don't know. Teach me something. What do you got? I might have thoughts after you tell me some information. <laughs> well, it was, so, okay, this whole, this whole podcast kind of like it, this capital gains tax solutions, right? So it's main mm. objective is to our main kind of like cornerstone strategy that we like to use on the sale of a highly appreciated asset is called a deferred sales trust. And it is basically uh, it's backed by IRC code 453. So it's a, it's an installment sale at the foundation of it. But essentially what you're able to do is you're able to, uh, liquidate a highly appreciated asset. It's pretty agnostic to the kind. So it can be a stock or a business or real estate or um, art or crypto or whatever. Um, it goes into this uh, unrelated third party trust, business trust, and then the asset is liquidated immediately. And that trust is funded. Mm -hmm. And then that trust turns around and writes you a note for 10 years at a certain preferred rate of return. And then those funds get reinvested mm -hmm. into whatever you want. It's an alternative to like a 1031 exchange. It's, but it's got a lot of benefits, including no time constraints, no like kind constraints. Um, you know, you can sell a business and go into stocks and bonds and real estate. You could sell real estate and go into stocks and, and just sit on the sidelines until yeah, you yeah. find a good deal and then go back. Um, so there's all these different advantages to it unlocks a ton of different freedoms as far as uh, time freedom, location yeah. freedom, entrepreneurial freedom, uh, like kind of freedom. It, it just, it opens up a whole world. So you're not constricted like you would be with a 1031. Certainly or, with the traditional 10. Yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, it's the, one of the things that we kind of come across, you know, relatively regularly is that, um, you know, it's a, it's a transaction that's not very common because a lot of people don't have these mega transactions all the time, right? Like you're right. not selling a, you know, $50 million business every day, right? Or even every yeah. year, right? That's maybe if, if you're, you know, in the top 1% of the top 1%, you've done two or three of them sure. or four of them, right? But the average sure. person, even the person who's making 50, is not having multiple transactions of huge assets and stuff like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, when the time comes, a lot of people don't, have a ton of information about it just because this is not that frequent of a transaction right frequent of an event so mm -hmm. there's a lot more you know knowledge and stuff from especially from the different cpas and so on and so forth um you know about strategies for income tax and all that kind of stuff so one of the things that we do, yeah one of the things that we do is you know we focus on that particular like little piece <clears throat> so when Let's say one of your clients has that big transaction that comes in, right? We have the strategy that allows them to just unlock a ton of these freedoms to go out there and, and reinvest the proceeds net of return fees instead of net of taxes. And so it's just a really powerful strategy. It keeps wealth in the family. Um, 
it can it can move assets outside the taxable estate so you don't have to pay the estate tax your kids don't have to pay the estate tax if you pass when you pass right um so it's just there's a lot of cool stuff about it and so uh you know we'll, we'll have this conversation a couple of times um you know and so it's just we always like to kind of pose that question right and different people come in with different uh, backgrounds and so on and so forth, right? The guy who's doing tech, you know, like a tech startup for, um, you know, whatever, a call center or something, right? Doesn't have any idea what, you know, about the, sure. about the different tax strategies and so on and so forth, right? Um, but I was just curious. I would say that I, I was gonna say, I would say that that's super interesting for, like the founder tech side of what I do, I think there is not a lot of conversation around how to shift like these newfound valuations and your potential exit and what will happen to that post the exit, um, especially in the tech space, because you have people who are amassing wealth at an unbelievable rate and wealth they've yeah. never had that did not exist in the family where this information wasn't being shared. But these conversations aren't happening. Like I have a trust, but I know so many of my peers that don't and have have never even thought about creating one. So I just think that's such an interesting... And these are people that are much more wealthy than I am. 